Good evening and welcome to the Performance, Governance and Audit Committee meeting on the 18th of November 2021. My name is Councillor Jeanette Stilts and I am the Chairman of this committee. Members, the setup for this meeting is designed to mitigate for COVID, therefore can I ask all present to work to the protocols agreed at Council on the 2nd of September 2021. In the interest of member and officer safety, we are streaming this meeting live as well as recording and by being present in the meeting you are giving your consent to being recorded. Members and officers during each item please put your hand up to indicate if you wish to speak and then I will invite you at the appropriate time. Please note that the YouTube live stream sound recording is dependent upon the correct use of the microphones therefore can I ask when, not in, when invited to speak you remember to turn your microphone on and turn it off when finished. Please reference a page or paragraph number when referring to the agenda items. Please keep your contributions as clear and concise as possible. Members, in addition to the officers in the chamber, there are three officers attending remotely. Finally, can I draw your attentions to the notices on the agenda papers regarding the different levels within the chamber? and advise that the fire exit door is behind this top table. Item two on the agenda, apologies for absence. May I have apologies for absence, Berna? Thank you, Chairman. We've received apologies for absence from Councillors Boyce and Edwards. Thank you. Thank you. Item three on the agenda is the minutes. It is recommended that the minutes of the meeting held on the 23rd of September 2021 found on pages 5 to 12 are approved as a true and accurate record. I so move. Do I have a second of that motion? I have a second motion. Thank you, Councillor Jarvis. If any member wishes to raise any matter of accuracy, if not, are you happy to accept those as an accurate record? Thank you. Item four on the agenda is declarations of interest. To disclose the existence and nature of any disclosable pecuniary interests, other pecuniary interests, or non-pecuniary interests relating to items of business on the agenda, having regards to paragraph six to eight of the Code of Conduct for members. Members are reminded that they are also required to disclose any such interests as soon as they become aware should the need arise throughout the meeting. Councillor Fleming. Thank you, Chair. Um, a non-pecuniary is a member of Essex County Council. Any matter that might arise. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other declarations of interest? No? Lovely. I will move on. Item 5, public participation. I can advise that we have not received any submissions from members of the public. Item 6 is the internal audit report. We move to item six on the agenda found on pages 13 to 14. Mr. Rubins, please present your reports. Thank you. Good evening. Um, with the chairman's permission, I'm, what I'm going to do is um, do this in two blocks. So the first block will be items 6A and 6B, which are pages 15 to 32 of your pack. Uh, I'll take those items and any questions um, and then move on to the three reports um, that we're presenting. So um, the first of the, of the two items I'm going to present in the first block is the progress report. Uh, it shows we've got, as I say, three reports that have come, come into this meeting. Um, we're expecting to be a very uh, busy agenda for the February meeting with probably six reports uh, to present there. Um, and so quite a lot of work underway at the moment. Um, and you also have within that progress report a sector update, which obviously is more for information. I su suspect most of these areas members are already aware of, but it's to um, obviously make sure you are aware of them. Um, and then uh, following that report, we have our, our follow up of previous recommendations. Uh, we've been able to sign off um, two of the uh, outstanding recommendations but there are still some outstanding particularly around flooding um, and affordable housing what i would say is if you look at the detail there you'll see that some action is being taken but they haven't yet got to the stage where we can sign them off as fully complete so obviously we need to see that happen uh, by the time of the next meeting and i will be chasing that up uh, to ensure that it has 
Um, I'll stop there and as I say I'm happy to take any questions on, on that block of work and then I'll go into the three detailed reports and we can take questions from there. Councillor Hurd. Thank you Chairman and uh, just like to go to um, page uh, 16 please which talks about the summary of work. Um, on the third paragraph which begins as a result um, it speaks about uh, the impact of COVID-19 and delays in delivery. Um, can I just can I just ask um, two things? First of all, something that's that is mentioned is uh, CRM, and it's got customer service CRM. I've looked through that. I can't seem to find what that actually stands for. Can you help me there, Chairman? All right, Mr. Rubens. Yeah. Customer relationship management. I see. Okay, that's fine. So, so there is one part on there which says customer service, customer relation management. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. So, my question is, uh, can I ask why? Why is there a delay? Uh, because of what impact has COVID had upon that? Because in my experience with audit work, uh, a lot of it doesn't have to be physically there. Um, why, why is there a delay, please? Good chat. So a lot of it's to do with um, officer time and availability um, at the start. Uh, obviously, we had a full, full plaque audit plan, um, as if there wasn't a COVID pandemic going on. Uh, but of course, there was a COVID pandemic coming on, which meant a lot of the officers were actually addressing that uh, issue at the time. And you can imagine back at the 1st of April, the start of the year, still very much peaks and lockdowns going on and actions taken around um, addressing the uh, health and safety risk as well as uh, business grants, for example, going out and also the work the officers were doing um, around protecting the public uh, and safeguarding the offices as well. Um, so that's meant a lot of delay to the actual audits get started. I mean, we're quite, quite pleased, to be honest, that we've actually started to catch up um, that work and the majority of the audits now will be later in the year than perhaps forecasts are actually now taking place and being caught up. So it's quite an ambitious plan, I would say, in the midst of a pandemic and tackling that. But uh, I think it's good work in, in actually trying to catch up on that plan. If I could just come come back on that, thank you very much indeed for that. But uh, so so the fault is not lying with the auditors; it's it's an internal uh, issue. Yeah, yes, that's right. It's to do with the staff uh, availability to actually um, assist with the audit and get that carried out. Thank you very much. Any other questions, uh, Mr. Rubens? Would you like to carry on? So, uh, as promised, um, we have three. Um, uh, more detailed reports which I'll, I'll, I'll briefly go through. So the first of um, the reports is on, um, just go to the right page, um, page 33 uh, which is the Covid recovery plan. Um, so um, this was the plan that the council has put together to um, uh, recover from Covid uh, and to develop um, a sort of way of working, a new way of working uh, to catch up uh, from 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 the impact of COVID, um, and we we we're very positive about this. Uh, we've given substantial assurance on both the design of this and the effectiveness. Uh, we think there's strong arrangements in place, a very clear plan, good um, uh, good reporting, good scrutiny of the plan, um, and we were we were very happy with it. We raised a minor point about the terms of reference for the reset and recovery group needing to be updated um, and we've also done some benchmarking against some other district councils around their plans and actually again the Malden plan compares well to those um, it's come, we've suggested you know you might want to look at one district which have managed to put all of their plan on one page to make it a bit more accessible um, to the public but on the whole as I say I think it's a very good plan um, and we were very positive about about that area. I'll move on just uh, to the next report. As I say, I'll take questions on the three reports at the end. Uh, so the next one is on partnerships. Um, so we've given moderate assurance on this, on the design and effectiveness of controls. Uh, again, I would say generally um, good arrangements in place. The council's identified its partnerships. As you'll know, there's a good process for nominating members to sit uh, on partnerships. Um, where we've come up with some issues, there's three really. One is around dist distinguishing more clearly between the two types of partnerships. So your smart partnerships, the sort of strategic ones, and the formal partnerships which you have to, uh, which have to be formed under on a statutory basis. So just making the distinction clearer between those two and what you need to do under each circumstance. 
Um, secondly, was around updating your thematic strategies um, to uh, align with the update of the corporate plan. That has already been done, I understand. Um, and thirdly, is around um, having more formal feedback from the partnership process in terms of terms of reference and minutes and so on. Uh, and again, that's been accepted by officers. So uh, three uh, recommendations there, which um, you know have been accepted and we will follow up in due course. And the last report is the fraud risk assessment. Um, this is um, not a standard internal audit report. It's an advisory piece of work. And uh, members who have been on this committee some time may remember uh, there was original recommendation for the council to develop a fraud risk assessment, which we assisted with. And that's really what this report is doing. It's showing you where the areas are that the council needs to work on. We haven't identified any significant areas on the whole. Again, I think there's a, a lot of good controls in place to um, deal with fraud, to identify it and deal with it. Um, but there are some areas there that we've um, suggested, um, for example, more sort of uh, data reviews of procurement uh, and contracts. Um, and um, we've also uh, um, uh, suggested um, there should be more staff documentation checks uh, and also removal of councillor signatures. You might be interested in this, particularly, I, I don't believe they're, they're held uh, in, or haven't been um, held uh, for the last couple of years but there were some historic ones on, on uh, that were available and obviously making sure those aren't available to the public so that they could use your signatures so uh, a few things like that that again the council has accepted and there's an action plan in place uh, and i'm sure again those will be followed through uh, in due course so uh, on the whole i would say for the three reports generally fairly positive um some areas for improvement but i um, happy to take any questions Thank you. Is there any questions, Mr. Rims? Councillor Jarvis. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I mean, I, I, I'll go through them in order, if I may. I mean, as far as the COVID recovery plan is concerned, I think we just need to give record congratulations to the Council. Clearly, we've got its act together. Substantially is your highest rating. Not easier to achieve. I don't think I've seen one of those recently. So I think some congratulations to the officers involved should be recorded. Um, just in sequence, uh, well, as far as the partnership issue is concerned, um, I think uh, it, it's quite clear there are, there are, that's moderate, there are some recommendations there. The third of those recommendations where it talks about, uh, you know, having minutes, I think I would emphasise that. I, 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 I know a number of people here have been elected to various bodies and then two years later people didn't even know they were on or they've never been to a meeting, nobody's ever seen any minutes. I, I realise the action point is clear, the council recognised that is a deficiency, but I think we'd all like to see that improve so that we can get the most out of those relationships. So I think, yes, there is there is work to do on that one, which you have quite rightly identified. But as far as the uh, the fraud uh, uh, interim review or, or, or sort, of sub, sub, sort of partial review that you've made, not a complete audit, clearly the chart on page 75 uh, I think is the most sort of a clear pictorial representation of uh, what you think of where the council is with fraud risk assessment in that sort of heat map chart, clearly showing there's nothing, nothing in the uh, in the red areas and just a few things in the amber areas. So yeah, well done again to the council on that. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Is there any other questions for? No. Okay, we'll go to the recommendations. The recommendations found on page 13 of the report that the committee considers, comments and approves the Little One Internal Audit Progress Report, November 2021 at 6A. Little Two, the follow-up of Recommendations Report, November 2021 at 6B. Item, uh, little Three, the COVID Response Plan Report, October 2021 at 6C. Little four, the partnership report, November 2021 at 6D. And five, the fraud risk assessment audit report, November 2021 at 6A. Uh, e. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Jarvis. Uh, members, are you all happy to accept those recommendations? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rubens. You are free to go now. Item seven on the audit of accounts um, is going to be, Mr. Rubens is about to leave, so we'll just give him a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Item 7 on the account is the update of the audit of accounts. We move to item 7, found on pages 81 to 86. Mr Leslie, will you please present the report? Thank you, Chair. Uh, since the last Statement of Accounts update, Public Sector Audit Appointments Limited announced that just 9% of authorities had their accounts audited by the 30th of September. COVID-19 and pressures in the audit market were listed as some of the contributing factors. In, previous update, in the previous update, it was reported that the audit of the Essex Pension Fund was not completed, which our auditors require for assurance on our pension figures. The latest update from Essex Pension Fund is that their audit has been significantly delayed and we do not have an expected completion time at the moment. The audit of our accounts has continued and the auditors have subsequently identified a classification issue with some of the COVID grants, which were new for last year. This relates to those grants to businesses where the council was passing money on from the government without any discretion on the amount. These have been recognised as income with matching expenditure in the income and expenditure account, which has a nil impact on the bottom line as income and expenditure matched. The nil impact on the bottom line is correct as the council was acting as an intermediary or agent for these grants. Um, they should not have been recognised in the INE account, however. The net financial position remains unchanged as a result of this technical classification and the amounts can be subtracted from the income and expenditure figures to resolve this. However, the auditors used the gross expenditure figures to inform their audit methodology and due to the high value of the grants, this has had a significant impact on that. Therefore, they will need to revisit their approach and conduct additional testing, which will impact on time and audit fees. Increased accounting complexities caused by COVID schemes were identified in the last update report, as well as the challenges faced during the closure process, and section five of the report details many of the other challenges that also presented themselves uh, during that time. Revised figures have been given to the auditors for them to revisit their methodology and we are currently working with them to agree a revised timetable to complete the audit. Do I have any questions for Mr Leslie? Councillor Hurd, then Councillor Fleming. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Page 81, um, please, um, or 82, rather. Um, it's, it, it carries on the, the sentence from... It carries on the sentence from uh, the bottom of page 80, 81, which talks about uh, the value of the grants at 26 million. Then over the page on 2082, it says the reduction this causes to the auditor's materiality level towards the end of the audit. I'm not quite sure what materiality level is. I wonder if you could help me with that. Um, but my question is, are we double auditing? Because is this 26 million pounds already audited? And are we auditing again? And if that is the case, are we suffering the cost from that? So in terms of the 26 uh, million, obviously, uh, that is subject to uh, checks uh, independently from um, from government in terms of uh, their schemes where they've given us money and they expect sort of checks in place anyway. However, um, that doesn't form part of the actual external audit who still need to check who's going through the accounts correctly and they're still the usual checks and balances in place. So it's, it's not sort of an additional or double audit. If you, if you like, they're very focused on uh, perhaps di different areas with different responsibilities um, from that side. But yes, they, obviously there's lots of checks that do, do go on uh, in regards to these things. In, in terms of the materiality, I, I mean, I've talked about the methodology that the auditors use and materiality, I guess, is perhaps one one of those levels. And it sets a threshold for items that the auditors are really interested in, or what they call their, their materiality level. And they use that level to inform some of the testing and some of the reporting, which they do. Because obviously now they're reducing their materiality level, uh, as a result of this, it means some of those things uh, perhaps that they weren't quite as um, high up on the materiality scale now are, which means they're having a look at the uh, methodology behind that and conduct uh, potentially some more testing. Okay, thank you for that. So, so it's sample size, really, is it? 
it, it, it could it could include sample sizes okay. Um, okay. As, as well potentially okay. thank you councillor fleming thank you chair a question for mr leslie i'm not i'm not sure whether this agenda item is is the best place to ask this question i just when you were talking about discretion over covid grants i wanted to ask a question about the top slicing of the arg whether um you sort of have figures for that uh, i was hoping maybe you could provide a written response after the meeting sort of how much we top sliced and whether any sort of cost benefit analysis had been done thank you yeah, happy perhaps to produce a written response um, after the meeting if that's okay thank you. is there any other questions councillor jarvis yeah thank you very much Chair. um yes i mean i think it, 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 it's this does need to be understood um, by councillors. You know, it is obviously very disappointing news. I mean, this is likely to result in certainly the auditor looking to uh, charge again for doing a lot of the audit work. Um, and uh, obviously also putting the pension issue to one side, which may mean the accounts would have been late anyway. Um, and that's not yet resolved. But this, it, it, as I understand it, although the timetable hasn't been agreed, it is likely to be somewhere like at least next February. That's the sort of time scale. So even if other councils get their accounts done early because the pension issue is resolved, ours won't be done early uh, because um, because because of this uh, the COVID issue. I think um, we will also have the challenging uh, aspect of the auditor wanting to charge us more fees, and this is on the back of increased proposed fees anyway, um, almost a doubling of fees over the last few years, and the auditor has made it clear. Um, that uh, some of this extra work they, they see uh, will be will be charged. So the cost could be substantially more uh, than we've budgeted. And I think, you know, I think uh, I, I've made it clear that uh, that should be challenged, in my opinion, because although it's true to say that an auditor sort of comes in at the end and assesses how a council has dealt with something, it's also true to say that there is such a thing as a scoping meeting early on in the process. During that scoping meeting, the expenses of this council were clearly identified as being not marginally more, but twice as much, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, twice as much as they normally are because of the, COVID, the way in COVID grants were going to be treated. So this would have been clearly explained to the auditor at the outset. At that time, I would have thought that it would have been reasonable in this period of everybody getting COVID grants and the uncertainty of how they were going to be dealt with, it would be reasonable to have suggested that rather than set a high materiality level using the additional expenses, which is what was done, options were given to the council. Would you like to defer the audit until we know how COVID grants are going to be dealt with? Um, would you like to have a lower materiality level in case the COVID grants are dealt with in a different way? And neither of those options were presented or discussed. Instead, what was put on the table was, no, this is the materiality level. Let's do it at a very high level because of the double expenses, which is what that's based on. Let's do checks at that level, not that many, but based on that materiality. And now we're faced, you know, months later, um, the auditor has come up with their paper. They produced a paper saying how these, uh, how, how the expenses, how, sorry, the COVID grant should be dealt with. Um, but clearly over the, over the past six months, this has been an issue, which the auditors have been toying with as all auditors we'd be toying with, because everybody's been receiving COVID grants. This isn't an issue just for our council. So I put it to members that I think uh, uh, more should have been said earlier, more options should have been on the table, and we should resist any additional charges that the auditor may wish to uh, lay upon us. Because don't forget, our officers will now, in any case, have to carry out quite a lot of duplication of work. And so uh, putting that to one side, that additional cost, which I presume we will just bear, I think we should resist very much any additional charge uh, that's uh, put before us. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Councillor Fleming. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Um, just, I just wondered whether Mr Leslie had an idea at this stage how, how much more it's likely to cost. Thank you. I don't have an idea at this stage. We've provided the auditors with updated figures uh, and they're currently uh, looking at how that will impact their audit and what steps they can take to sort of re reduce the impact of that. But we don't have the uh, details at the moment. Mr Leslie, can you um, tell us when did you do the scoping um, 
meeting with the auditors when this was first picked up? I believe the auditors presented um, their audit plan to the committee, um, I think, in July time. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Mr Leslie? No. Recommendations are found on page 81 of the report. And the recommendation is that the report be considered. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Fleming. Um, is everybody happy with that? Are you like happy to vote with that on a cent? Yes. Is it is it appropriate to? We have got the auditor. Uh, I think have the auditor. Yes. yes. Uh, would, would it, would, I'm sorry if this is out of line. No. Uh, I, I, I think it would be appropriate, perhaps, for them to give us a short statement on the position if you feel that's uh, of merit at this stage. Yes. Um. Can't, thank you, Councillor Jarvis. We can do that. Turn your mic off. Um, Mr. Hewitson, you are online. Would you like to give a short statement to the committee as to why we find ourselves in this position and any questions they want to ask you? Certainly, Chair. Um, included in the pack of papers in the appendix a to mr leslie's report is our letter that accompanies that that sets out the a high level summary of the timeline that has got us to where we are and the issues that we've encountered and what the the scale and the nature of the problem is um in terms of picking up some of the questions that were posed by committee members um in terms of where we go from here, yes, the financing have provided us with an updated set of financial statements, and my team have been looking at those in the last few days. Um, we estimate that the materiality figure has fallen, as I put in my summary, to around £700,000, a shade under. We've looked at the scope of our work, and there are not only a number of areas where the sample sizes will need to increase, as one of your members suggested but also some areas where testing that we've done around analytical reviews um no longer fall within the expected threshold the acceptable threshold and they will also need to be revisited uh, one chrome of good news is that we have not identified any fresh areas of audit that need to be opened so it's there was a worry that we might have scoped some things out because they were sufficiently small that we could and we'd have to scope them in and start those areas afresh. Um, the team have done an exercise to review that. Don't believe there are any fresh areas of auditing. It's just a case of extending our work in the areas that we've already been looking at or refining our expectations where they don't currently give us sufficient assurance. Um, I don't have an awful lot more to add to Mr. Leslie's uh, summary. It was very complete, uh, but I am happy to field any questions from the committee members. Okay, thank you. Committee, have you got any questions for Mr. Hugh? Councillor Jarvis. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Oh, Paul, if you don't mind, uh, could you just comment with regards to um, uh, potential additional charges? You've heard me say that I think the council should robustly challenge those. But I mean, do you have an idea of what sort of money we're talking about? At this stage, Council, I'm afraid I don't. Um, as I said, we and my team have been going through the audit work to understand how much additional work is needed to operate at the lower materiality level. The next step, as we agreed with your finance team, is to draw up a project plan uh, to make sure that we've got appropriate resource at the right skill level doing the work at a time that's convenient to you to minimise disruption. Once we know what needs to be done, we'll then be in a better position to understand what the total cost may be and then we can start having a conversation about that. Um, so at the moment I realise this is not entirely satisfactory but I can't give you a, a clear answer to that question at the moment, Councillor Jarvis. Thank you. Just as one supplementary chairman, if I may. With regards to the sort of timetable vis-a-vis uh, -vis the sort of scoping and coming up with this issue rather late in the day, do you, do you accept in principle that your firm will take that into account when it's looking at 
raising further charges against this council. Councillor, I, I, my, the, nature, the spirit in which I enter into any fee negotiation is always one that is based on an open dialogue and a fair settlement at the end of the day. I don't, I never got into public sector auditing in order to have the public sector's eyes out. That is not how I like to do business, it's not how I like to behave. Um, but we do need to agree a fair fee. So I expect there will be a robust negotiation between the finance team and our team once we know what the number is. And I'm sure all issues will be brought to the table. If it is the case that we cannot reach a mutually agreeable settlement, then the ultimate arbitration is through the PSAA, who must agree all audit fee variations anyway, and they will give the council the opportunity to put their case forward if they feel it's not been appropriately taken into account. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman, for that. Thank you for that clarification. Appreciate it. Are there any more questions? No. Thank you very much for uh, briefing the uh, chamber. So back to the recommendation that's found on page 81 of the report and that to the report to be considered. I had a seconder, which was Councillor Fleming. Are you all happy to accept that recommendations? Thank you. Counts, uh, item eight on the agenda is the report for the decision to opt into the National Audit uh, Scheme for Auditors appointments. We move to item eight, found on pages 87 to 100. Mr. Leslie, will you please present that report? Thank you. Uh, in December 2016, the Council agreed to opt in to the National Audit Appointment Arrangements established by the Public Sector Audit Appointments, PSAA, for the period covering the accounts up to in and including 2022 to 2023. Uh, procurement is now underway for the next period. The Council has three options in this regard, as detailed in paragraph 3.2 to arrange their own procurement and make the appointment themselves, to do so in conjunction with other bodies, or we can join the national scheme. Paragraph 3.4 details the requirements to make the appointment directly or with another body. This would require the council to establish an independent auditor panel, the majority of which could not be councillors or past councillors or their close family or friends. The audit panel would need to make the appointment and manage the contract for the duration of the audit term. The recommendation is to opt into the national scheme on the basis it would provide economies of scale, expertise and avoid the resource required and risk of operating an independent auditor panel. In the last appointing period, only nine out of 485 qualifying authorities opted out of the national scheme, with two of those later opting back in. Thank you, Mr. Leslie. Do I have any questions for Mr. Leslie? Councillor Fleming. Thank you, Chair. I wanted to ask Mr. Leslie, do you, do you know which councils the nine are? And, and do you have any sort of information as to were they were they able to negotiate better fees? Thank you. Um, I, I do know three of the seven which were which are left um, outside of the scheme. Um, they are actually uh, in Essex, uh, Police, Fire and Crime Commissioner, uh, the Police and Essex um, Fire um, as well. Um, other they, I believe, are very happy uh, with the arrangements that they've made, um, opting out. Um, and, and the feedback I've had is very been satisfied with the arrangements that they have in place. Councillor Jarvis. Uh, um, thank you, Chairman. I mean, I, I will in a moment be very happy to sort of second this because I think councillors should be aware, as they've heard the stats, very few people opt out. There's a reason very few people opt out because if you opt out, you have to actually go through a whole process which is quite expensive. So, you know, sometimes when you're dealing with an auditor that you've been given. You think to yourselves, well, I'd like to pick my own one. You know, perhaps I'd do better. But the answer is you won't. And the reason you won't is because it will cost you a lot more money to set up all the infrastructure, the officer time, in actually 
uh, appointing one yourself. And that may, you may not do a better job, obviously, in appointing one. It will certainly probably cost you more money. The other thing is, um, I uh, have fortunately been able to speak to the officers at uh, uh, the National Scheme for Audit Appointments. They're a professional bunch of people, and they've done all of this before. And if you wanted anybody to be negotiating or acting as an arbitrator on your behalf, they're the sort of people you'd want. So for me, I have absolutely no hesitation at the moment you know, in seconding um, this recommendation. And uh, I understand if some councillors might think, wouldn't it be good to do it ourselves? But the bottom line is, in my opinion, it wouldn't be. Thank you, Councillor Charles. Thank you. Uh, Mr Hewitson, you wanted to come in. You've got your hand up. Yes, it was just to add um, a comment that I know that three of the local authorities local to me uh, went outside the PSAA contract. And just by way of a cautionary tale, they did fall out with their auditor who resigned and left them struggling to find somebody to pick up their audit because they weren't in the PS, they didn't have the safety of the PSAA arrangement around them to effectively require somebody to undertake their audit. So just further context for committee's consideration. Thank you very much. Is there any more questions for Mr. Leslie? No, thank you. The recommendations are found on page 87 of the report. The recommendation to the council, little one, is that the council accepts the public sector audit appointments invitation to opt into the sector-led option for the appointment of external auditors to principal, local government and police bodies for five years from the 1st of April 2023. Do I have... Thank you, Councillor Jarvis. Is everybody happy to accept those recommendations? Thank you. Yeah, if the auditors would like to leave, they are welcome to um, exit. Thank you for joining us at this meeting. Thank you very much, Chair. I will take it back to that. Thank you. Item 9 on the agenda is the Section 106 six monthly update and infrastructure funding statement. We move to it agenda item 9 found on pages 101 to 112. Mr. Dobson, would you please present the report? Thank you, Chairman. Mrs. Altoff Shoreland is present on Teams to present this report for us. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello. Um, but yeah, I'm going to uh, present this report. That was written by Stephen Andrews, who's currently off sick, um, so I've stepped in to do this for him tonight. Um, the report covers the six monthly update in respect of section 106s. Um, it also asks for approval to publish on the council's website the annual infrastructure funding statement for the year 2020 to 2021. Very broadly, um, since the last report to committee in June, the council's received payments from developers of just under £140,000 to go towards health facilities and youth facilities in Burnham on Crouch. Also, since the last report, the Council's paid out £8,000 towards allotments in Burnham and £50,000 to the Essex Wildlife Trust for works at the Blue House Farm Nature Reserve. Um, additionally, since the last report, the Council secured 11 affordable houses, nine affordable rent and two for shared ownership. With regard to the infrastructure funding statement, um, this covers the period April 2020 to March 2021. So it's a slightly different period to the um, report that we've just covered. Um, it's a mandatory requirement um, for the council. We have to do this and we, ha we should be publishing this statement on our website by the 31st of December each year. So during the 12 month period covered by the uh, infrastructure funding statement, requests for payments um, generated into the council £121,620. There were no payments out during the period and Section 106 has delivered 150 affordable homes. That's 116 affordable rented mm -hmm. homes and 34 shared ownership homes. 
Thank you. Is there any questions? Councillor Jarvis. Oh, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I've got one question. It's really just for members' information, because it is a point you'll be aware, Chairman, we did raise at the agenda meeting with the Office of Concern, oh. which is that on, on section 4.3, um, so that's page 102, uh, it does refer to how much has been received and how much how much that is of a total sum. 45 hasn't been received, 140 has. And I think what, I, what I'd what i like to ask, what I have already asked for, and what we'd like to see in the future, uh, is um, some sort of performance, clear performance evidence. Um, so that sort of statistics put into some sort of chart, so that over a period of time, we can understand in simple terms how effective are we in, in getting the money from the 106 agreements. And I think some sort of chart will, would be fairly easy to put together. And we can see if we're getting better or worse as far as that particular performance aspect is concerned. And I, I have mentioned this already, as you know, Chairman, but I'm mentioning it for the benefit of other councillors. That is something I've requested, and it's something that the, uh, um, uh, the, the person who normally would deliver this report, the name embarrassingly I've forgotten, has said he will do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and you want to come back? Um, yes, I was just going to say, it might be an idea to arrange... Um, a quite short workshop with the members of the committee just to go over exactly uh, a bit of a refresh about what section 106s are and how we can report this more effectively now how members would like to see this because there is lots of information that sits behind these reports that perhaps we can draw out more effectively for members okay members would you like uh, a short workshop for this 106 yes and that all members are in agreement of that. Uh, Councillor Keys, I'll come to you after Councillor Fleming. Oh, Councillor Fleming did have her hand. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, I don't know whether this is for Anne, possibly uh, Mr Dodson, um, the report references the Infrastructure Implementation Group. I was uh, interested to find out who who sits on that and uh, what member oversight there is for that. Thank you. And uh, it's a variety of officers um, across the council who who would have some kind of um, role to play in impl implementing the spend on the infrastructure. So um, somebody from um, the community, the, the, the team that does the um, communities, parks and gardens and things like that, they, they sit on it. Uh, John Swords for, for affordable housing, Matt Lee sits on it, I sit on it, um, Paul Dodson sits on it. There's a strategic group and a delivery group. As far as I'm aware, I don't think there is any member oversight. We don't have any members um, sitting on any, either of those two groups. Um, the reports actually come to this committee about Section 106s. Thank you. Mr Dobson. Thank you, Chairman. It's just to reiterate, it's an operational group about making sure that the work goes on behind the, the scenes to um, monitor what's happening and make sure we're delivering on any Section 106 that, that comes to the Council itself. And um, just to reiterate what um, Mrs Altoff Shawland said, the, 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 the member oversight is, is very much through this committee. That's where the, the results of those those meetings come to, and it's to inform the work that comes here. Thanks. OK, I'll go, let you come back, and then I'll go Councillor Jarvis, Councillor Hull, Councillor Stevens, and Councillor Hurd. Oh, sorry, Councillor... Councillor... St yeah, Councillor Keys. So I'll let you come back first. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm I'm not so I'm not concerned so much now that uh, we have the two uh, new officers in the policy team about collection of um, 106 developer contributions. I think that we've actually made great strides in that area in the last year, and I'm very pleased that they're with us. Um, I think my concern is is the delivery is getting it out the door and, and planning and and delivering it for our residents. Um, I know that we all know the issues with the GPs across Malden. Um, I don't want to sound like a stuck record, but um, I, th I think that's my concern, is the delivery is 
it is not moving as fast as it could. Thank you. Mr Dobson, do you want to come back? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, we have internally with the, the Section 106 that comes to us, we have a programme approach and we've extended that to all of the, the Section 106 funding. So, in effect, I think some, some of the information that um, officers would share at the workshop is that we have a clear programme schedule of all of the money when it comes in, when it's due to be spent and the projects that it's, it relates to, and ultimately when the backstop is, because if, if things aren't delivered, there's a, there's a clawback date on um, some of that Section 106 funding. So as well as we put that in place internally for all of the projects we were delivering, we've then worked with partners, and obviously we're dependent on partners, be it the NHS, Essex County Council, to deliver infrastructure that, that they are the statutory authority for. So we have all of that information as well within those programme plans, and we do regular reviews with them to try to ensure that, that they're spending it on time. But we are still, to an extent, in their hands on the, the delivery of that, although we do monitor it and we do work proactively with them to encourage the prompt delivery of those infrastructure items. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Keyes. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm just um, interested to see the 11 affordable homes secured through the SL 106. The other sites comprise of nine affordable rented and two shared ownership. Are they in Malden or Burnham? Where's the majority of them? Do we know? Or just purely through? Is that a question for you, Mr Geller? Okay. If you could respond to that in writing, that would be lovely. Councillor Hull. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I heard about the youth, um, what, the 106 money going to the youth in Burnham on Crouch. Um, could you tell me more about how you'd go about finding out what you want with that money? Is that true? Or is that for Anne? Would that come up in the workshop? Uh, I'm not sure. Would that be better coming up in your workshop for the members? Yeah, it can do. I can... Um... I can I can email the answer if you want. Yes, that's lovely. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Thank that, you. That would be lovely. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Stevens. Thank you, Chair. Coming back to this forty-five thousand that's awaiting payment, and we've we've sort of walked around it a bit, but I think you know it's a quarter of the amount, and I think I'd like to know: is that a, a grave risk of never coming forward, or is it um, actions all in hand? It's expected next week. How dangerous is it, this 45 missing thousand? Thank you. Anne, do you want to answer that? Um, I, can I just clarify what the question is? Question is was it how, how sure are we that the money that is not, that hasn't come forward yet, is going to come forward? Was that, was that the, the, the nub of the question? Yes, that's right. Thank you. Yeah, well, Section 106s have triggers. So um, once the development starts and the triggers start to be met, then the developer has to pay, has to pay them and there are consequences if they don't. De developers do pay them once the triggers are met, but the triggers are normally staged. So you'll get maybe a payment after so many houses are completed and then another payment and then a payment at the end. So that's why the money seems to trickle, trickle in, really, because because of the triggers. But what, as I said, once the development started, then the money is going to come in. We're pretty sure the money is going to come in. It's if the development doesn't come forward that then, then of course, then there is no funding to come forward. Thank you, Councillor Hurd. Um, thank you, Chairman. Actually, I, I think Councillor Stevens has almost uh, got, got my point. But the, the question I would ask is, is that 45,780 overdue? I appreciate we're awaiting it. Is it overdue or is it something that will come to us? Please. Um, if well, the development must have started so if it started it will come to us when the triggers are met um that it sometimes it does take a long time for the triggers to be met because the triggers might actually be money coming in at the end of the process um 
in the workshop we can go into triggers in a little bit more detail and we can go into individual um, pieces of infrastructure in a little bit more detail. Can I just come come back on that? Because I think I think if uh, if we're being told that that forty six thousand pounds is is still awaiting, I think I'd like to know whether it's overdue or whether those triggers have been met. Uh, because it's one thing to await it; it's quite another if we're waiting for a late payment. So, is that something that can be established, please? Um, well, uh, as far as I'm aware, we're up to date with all of our uh, requests for payments. So triggers if money hasn't come in it means triggers hasn't been met or we put out a request for payment and the money hasn't come in yet thank you and, and one more question is i, I see mm -hmm. that uh, I, I think i'd be perhaps cock a hoop if i was uh, in burnham but is there any money forthcoming for other areas of the district well we can we can send you we, i can send you more details by email or we can go through it at the workshop in more detail thank you councillor jarvis and then councillor fleming uh thank you chairman sorry without wishing to sort of harp on this point um perhaps you could uh, mention to uh, uh officer andrews um that i think it, should, it, it it would easily should easily be made clear um this is the amount due uh this is the amount we've received um the, of the total amount due this is the amount that's triggered that we haven't got yet or this is the amount of bad debt. You know, I think the uh, the phrasing in the paragraph is ambiguous. We don't know if it's outstanding or not. We don't really know if it should have come in through a trigger. So I think uh, back to my sort of point about the sort of clear statistics, perhaps uh, when that is looked at, preventing performance statistics, we could be a bit clearer in the narrative in the report mm -hmm. uh, because councillors quite rightly uh, are saying well, it's not clear what awaiting means. So I think a little bit of work on that. Of course, that can come up in the workshop as well. But I think when we're presented with figures, we want to know if we should be worried or not. And I, don't, I think at the moment we're un, unsure of whether we should be worried or not. And that's not a good state of affairs. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Fleming. Thank you, Chair. Um, the report references the uh, Essex County Council infrastructure funding statement. I wondered whether officers, when that is published, presumably at the end of the year as well, whether it would uh, they could circulate that to members uh, so that they have that for their information. Um, and then also my other question, which might be for Mr. Leslie, actually, um, looking at page page 109 table 2.3 there's health uh balance held march end of march 2021 455,000 for health can i just understand it correctly is is that we we spend that on health or or the nhs or the ccg it, it's sitting in our coffers who who actually spends that money thank you Thank you. I also um, ask Anne just to confirm as well, but uh, I believe this table sets out how much uh, we've received in receipts, so it should be amounts sitting in our balance sheet for us to spend in accordance with those um, agreements. Uh, uh, so that's yeah, that's right. We, we, Health will have a project, the NHS um, will have a project. They will then ask us for the money and then we remit it to them. Are you happy with that? Yes, thank you. So um, just a question for um, so delivery is, is actually down to the NHS, then you're, you're waiting for them to to put together yes. a, 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 a project for you. Yes, but it must be within the terms of the section 106. But yes, so it has to be site specific. Uh, yes, it depends on the terms of the section 106. I think most of them are area specific area okay thank you thank you are there any other questions councillor Hull um it, it, there's 106 money that they said you said is coming to Burnham I'd like to point out that um, Blue House Farm is actually in Fanbridge it's not in Burnham but is it the 106 money is that from Burnham all the houses that are going up there is, um, it, is it from or is it from everywhere else? Can can you turn your mic? 
Councillor Fleming, can you answer? <laughs> I can answer that. I think um, Councillor Hull, it's from there was a development of roughly 100 homes in North Bambridge. So, so it will, I would think it would be related to that. Thank you. May, maybe uh, Miss, oh. Mrs. Holt Shotland can find that information and oh, email great. it. Yeah, because we've had a lot of houses in Burnham, and if it's all going out of Burnham, but also coming back to the NHS, Southminster have been waiting. They've got the housing um, at the Fisher's Way, and it, we're still waiting for the NHS, and that's been waiting for a long time. And Southminster are desperate for a bigger um, doctor's surgery, and that was brought up, been brought up every time since. Thank so you. I don't know what's happening there. I think um, Mr. Dobson wants to come in on that one. Just on, on the Southminster um, Health um, Centre, um, we do regularly meet with uh, the NHS to ensure that that's going forward and I confirm that the, the business case is progressing through the NHS um, and we're regularly monitoring where they are in terms of, of progressing that to ensure that it is delivered. Do we know how far they've got? Because this has been like quite a few years now, hasn't it? I understand they've passed the outline business case and are finalising um, the full business case subject and then, then a planning application will come in. They've not already got the planning? Is it, is it, did it not come on with the housing? Mm, outline, they, they need to put in they need to put in a planning application for the right. to so, develop it. And we, like how we... can you turn your microphone off when you do that's you can turn it back on if you could <laughs> It's just that it's been going on a long time and we just wondered, you know, mm. the people in Southminster do need they haven't got they're very tight for space in there and they get more and more houses and, and most people in Southminster can't get a doctor. May maybe um if Mr Dobson can find out how that's going on and then email um, the members to let them know where we are with that. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mrs. Holt Shotland, um, for your presentation. Members, sorry, Councillor Heard. Well, I, I, I understood it right, but I think that I'd, it wouldn't be confined to Southminster. I think everywhere um, is, uh, is very short of, of uh, medical staff so yeah. i certainly wouldn't want it limited to Southminster. No, but if mr they, dobson can go away and find out some more information that would be lovely they have been this has been going on a long long time and it's just that their surgery isn't very big to get doctors in so they really yeah, start same here yeah. um, the recommendations are found on page 101 of the report little one that the committee considers the six monthly update on section 106 planning obligations Little two, that the committee approves the Morden District Council Infrastructure Funding Statement 2020 to 2021 for publication and government submission asset as set out in Appendix 1. Do I have a seconder? Absolutely. Thank you, Councillor Jarvis. Is everybody happy to accept those recommendations? Great. Thank you. Item... 10 on the agenda is a report process improvement framework. We move to item 10 found on pages 113 to 126. Mr. Dobson, would you please present? It's Cheryl, is it? Oh, Miss Hughes, would you like to present the report? Uh, good evening, members. Uh, the process improvement framework is a document that outlines our approach to continual improvement work at Malden District Council and it's provided as an appendix to this report. Uh, process improvement is work that was already kicked off as part of 2019 Council transformation and current activity is part of our existing staffing structure. So it's brought to the committee for context and feedback rather than a request to do anything new. It is an important part of our wider approach around how we address performance issues and how we implement processes that are identified as part of internal audits. In the summary of key issues section of the header report, we also highlight how this work fits with wider corporate requirements and organisational learning over the last few years. 
Process improvement is crucial work to support the value for money criteria of Malden as a local authority. And throughout the framework at Appendix A, we have also highlighted how the work supports wider corporate objectives, such as those set out in the ICT policy. Page 121 of the report pack also highlights some case studies of the type of work that the team carry out. And page 122 onwards sets out future plans and work of the team, as well as potential risks to delivery and what our mitigations are. In the header report, you will see that there are two recommendations. Uh, the first is that the committee reviews and feeds back on the framework. Um, and the second is around committee appointing member representatives. We're seeking member nominations to work closely with the team as we develop processes to help add a layer of customer feedback and to help input into future process improvements. We're recommending two appointments from Performance Governance and Audit Committee with a further two to be recommended from Overview and Scrutiny Committee at their next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Hughes. I have had two members that have come forward um, and shown an interest in being the representatives from this committee, and that was Councillor Stevens and Councillor Fleming. Are we happy to agree that those are our two representatives? Thank you. So the recommendation... Oh, sorry, has anybody got any questions <laughs> for... Miss Hughes. Councillor Stevens. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know if it's really a question, it's a statement, really. I see on page 122 that one of our achievements is to remove the pink sack collections at Malden District Council Office. Um, well, that's probably happened because of COVID anyway, um, but I imagine it perhaps happened before that. I've got to say that I don't see that as an achievement at all. If I lived just next door to the council office and I came in here and I just wanted to pick up a roll of pink sacks and walk out again, that really wouldn't or certainly shouldn't take anybody very long to serve me. And if I've got poor mobility and I can't do that, I've now got to walk half a mile to the nearest shop or get in my car. Um, I just don't see that as an improvement, and I wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jarvis. Uh, just picking up on that point, I think uh, if you're a member of that uh, group going forward, you'd be able to make that comment, wouldn't you? Yeah. I think I just wanted to say, Chair, and I think I mean, it's clearly a very good idea. I mean, that you, you can't fault the approach. It's clearly going to uh, look where value can be added. Mm. Um, my question is uh, just for confirmation that there's no additional cost involved. Uh, from the council. My understanding is that there isn't, and this is just a reorganisation of how things are done with existing staff. Okay. Mr Leslie? Yeah, yes, that's right. It just lays out the process that the existing team are taking and sort of the, the work um, that they do, the good work that they do to actually improve things. We, in fact, um, we, we relies on uh, a previous um, growth bid around the process improvement work, and this just continues on, so there's no additional resource um, going in other than that's already, already agreed. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairman, for, um, for thank you for giving us that confirmation. I mean, it clearly seems to me to be an excellent piece of work which we um, we should um, applaud and um, support. Thank, thank you, you. Councillor Hurd. Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I, I think um, although it might not be an achievement to have the removal of pink sack elections, uh, I, I quite understand it. But actually, this is this is more of introducing a network of other places where it can be collected. So I know that it can be. Collect. I know that I can get bags from my local paper shop, from the town hall and from some garages as well. So I see that actually as an improvement. Yes, we can't get them from here. Uh, I know that when they were originally placed, they simply got taken en masse, just stolen. Uh, so I don't, I don't really think that uh, that was an ideal situation. But I am seeing other networked places distributing these sacks, which I do see as an improvement. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, is there any other questions? No. The recommendations are found on page 113 of the report. Little one, that the committee reviews the feedback on the process improvement framework set out in Appendix A. Little two, that the committee appoints two member representatives and seeks two representatives from Overview and Scrutiny Committee at its next scheduled meeting to work closely with the team 
around the website testing at customer feedback. Um, do I have a second? Thank you. Are members happy to accept those recommendations? Thank you. Item 11 on the agenda is any other items of business that the chairman decides are urgent. There are none. So item 12 is the closure of the meeting. Members, thank you for your contributions this evening. I now draw the meeting closed at 20.35. As the meeting is now closed,